We just pray that you would do that. Amen. Amen. And just very briefly, uh, for our Monument family, we do just want to remember the homegoing announcements that we do have. So on tomorrow, um, we're going to be um, celebrating the life of uh, Sister Zula Lofton, um, the mother of Annette Lofton, longtime choir member. So on, that will be on tomorrow here at the church. Service is at 11. The, um, the viewing is at 11. The service is at 12. We want to be in prayer for her. We want to be in prayer for uh, Latrice and the entire um, family of Sister Erling Thompson. Her service is going to be on uh, Saturday the 2nd uh, here at the church. The wake is at 10, and then the service is at 11 o'clock. Um, and so for sure on Saturday, we're asking that the Monument uh, Mass Choir uh, would partake in the service as she was a faithful member of the choir. And so we want to continue to be in prayer for both of those families. Amen. Amen. And then lastly, for those of you, uh, for the choir members and other members who are planning on uh, traveling to Ecorus, Michigan, to be with Apostle as he speaks for uh, Bishop Mar Marvin Miles, um, there's going to be a sign-up sheet in the back on today uh, so that you can secure your ride on the bus, and so you can do that on today. Um, very brief announcements, but we want to also welcome those of you who may be visiting with us on tonight. And so certainly if tonight is your first time being here, we certainly welcome you. And we pray that you won't, this won't be your last time coming, but that you would continue to come and bless us with your presence. Um, we're going to turn you back into the hands of our praise and worship team. Just before the praise team come, I have a follow-up announcement. You need to know why you are here tonight. Yeah, you do. We're here to honor the Apostle Mark Hinton. Say the Apostle Mark Hinton. Oh, y'all ain't saying that quite. You better come on, the Apostle Mark Hinton. Hallelujah. In the book of Jeremiah, he says, And I will give you pastors according to mine heart. Which ye shall feed you with knowledge and understanding, which is the word of God. Our pastor has been equipped. Our pastor has been prepared. Our pastor has received the call of God. He has been chosen by God to lead the monument of faith. He is anointed. He is appointed for this day and this hour. He has been given to the monument of faith. He's a man of prayer. He's a man that rules well. He's a man that cares for his people. He is a giver. We are here to bless our apostle, Mark Hinton. Stand to your feet even though he ain't here and put your hands together. the Lord. Hallelujah. All right, praise team. Let's sing one juicy hot one for the people. Hallelujah. Knowing that we love the Lord. Oh, bless your name, Jesus. Come on and clap your hands. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Say your Lord is high. 
receive a portion of the mass choir. Put your hands together for the monument of faith, mass choir. I said, put your hands together.
wanted to give you a piece of memorabilia. After 40 years, Pastor, yeah. we could not let this day go back without honoring you as our shepherd. How you loved us. We couldn't let the day go back. We wanted to tell you, honoring Apostle Mark Anthony Hinton, 40 years of ministry from the Monument of Faith Mass Choir, and also happy birthday, 58 years. That means at the age of 18 years old, church. He grabbed the elders. He grabbed the presidents on the day of Pastor Richard Hinton's passing. And he had the strength, the strength of God to know that these leaders will probably hang their head down low. But he moved even in his grief, called us and said, we gonna make it. be grieving. Lead us grieving. He told them, be confident because we're going forth in unity. We thank God for the visionary. Pastor, the progress. we'll never forget that day. I'll never forget that day. And we pray that you'll find some time to get away, to grieve and do and cope because everybody's going away grieving now. They're going, coming back or whatever. But he's been 24-7. That's the love of God. That's the call of God. The call of God. And we thank you. Give God a praise. Hallelujah. It's now in your hands. Somebody look at somebody and tell them God is good. Tell them he's good all the time. Somebody ought to shout hallelujah. to look forward and not to look backward knowing that what God has for you Bishop Trana says what's to come is better than what's been anybody believe that for yourself I believe it for myself I tell you what I want you to do I want you to get out of your seat and I want you to greet four or five people show them some love and tell them everything around you is getting better Come on, get out of that seat.
bless the Lord at all times and his praises shall continually be in my mouth. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us, what? Exalt his name together. God bless you. You can be seated. Thank God for the choir. Put your hands together. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. I am so happy today that Tri Stone is with us. My friend and my brother, amen, is here today, and I'm excited about that. God is so good. I've learned, mother, how to hear from God. Learn how it's important to hear. Elders, it's important to hear from God. And I'm so excited, I tell you. I came in and just as I said a moment, I got a word from the Lord. I, I can't share it till Sunday. But I promise you, God gave me a word. I am so excited about it. That it brought it just brought joy to my soul. Hallelujah. <laughs> brought joy to my soul. And I thank God for his goodness. I'm always happy to see my uncle sitting over there. Put your hands together. Oh, I love and appreciate you. He's just been steadfast. Amen. It's such a great encouragement, uncle. I want to tell you that because we don't always get a chance to say it, but you bless me every time I see you sitting in that chair. And you have served this church for so many, many, many years. And I thank God for you. As we're moving forward, we're not going to hold up the time. I want to do this real swiftly. I want every person that can and will, I want you to get a $20 seed in your hand. Get $20 in your hand. Amen. $20 in your hand. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. Amen. I want you to get an envelope if you need one. I know this is often time, but I, I just want to sing this old. I've got a feeling and it is
family, my lovely wife. Thank you all so much, my grandchildren, my cousins, and mother-in-law. I love you all. Thank you so much. The cake is so very beautiful. And at the end, at the end of the service, they got something to say to me. Thank you to him and to Tristone for coming out, helping us to celebrate. Amen. Thank you so much. I want y'all to help me do something now. I need your help. I need you to put your hands together and make some noise in this place like you in a coliseum somewhere. Uh, for all of you who are Golden State fans, I just want you to act like you inside the stadium and James Harden is walking off the field. Or maybe you're a LeBron fan. Making it on the skin of your chinny chin chin. <laughs> I want you to make some noise in this place and welcome this man of God 
we're going to make him feel right at home. Come on, my man, put your hands together. So glad every time I get a chance to come and share, and Mark and I are you know we, I think we think we brothers for real, because <laughs> yeah, everything we do we tie to it, and uh, so we're willing to do all the stuff together, cry together, fight together, wrestle together, and this stuff, and to handle things. And so so honored to come and share. And you see, try stone, any try stone in the audience, wave your hand if you're out there. There you are. And here, Tristone loves you. <laughs> Tristone loves you. Amen. And thank you for this opportunity to come and share and be a part. I'm going to let the choir come and minister to us just a little bit uh, on the, uh, Pastor, Pastor Holman, and then we'll be ready to go right after that. Amen. Oh, 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 the earth is the Lord's. 
Anybody know that today? And the fullness there. Just go ahead, speak to somebody, and just tell them something good God has done for you on today. I know you got enough in your testimony repertoire to go back and take a look at and say, I'm here because God keeps doing great things for me over and over again. Aren't we honored to be here 40 years preaching? Four years here pastoring, 17 years pastoring all together. We're honored to be here together to share with my brother on this particular day. And, um, and, and you're right, he does need to get away. Amen. He needs to get away. 
you get a chance to go and relax and and uh, and pull things back together. My soul, my soul. say that again. He's my keeper. Somebody in here can say he kept me through the storms, through the rain, through all kinds of situations. The Lord kept me. Hallelujah. My God, every time I think about how good God is, I get excited about the fact that I don't need an excuse to praise him because I already got too many reasons. Talk to your neighbor say, pick a reason and tell God thank you for it. You got enough in your history that you can say that he brought me this far. Not because I did anything so right, just because he is a good God. Hallelujah. Somebody shout glory in the room. Yes. I want to go, if we will, and look right at the word as we look at this time of blessing for this man of God and for this church and ministry. I'm going to read maybe an unusual scripture for this, but it's a scripture of prophecy, and it's a scripture of the light for those who are believers so we can have a good look at uh, the unique promise of God and talk about where it comes from historically and how it matches where we are and points to the future. If you would turn to 2 Chronicles 7, verses 12 through 14. It's a very familiar scripture. Everybody know it, so you almost can quote it. But I want to just look at it real quick. We don't have to be long with this. I want us just to go and enjoy God for a little bit. If I could have something. Amen. And thank God. Amen. For Lady Grace. Yeah. 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 Amen. God bless you. Amen. That's my sister. Amen. Amen. Yes, that's my sister. Yes, Lord. She checked both of us at the same time sometimes. <laughs> yes, Lord. Scripture here, the scripture reading, and of course, we're talking about a situation in the circumstance of Solomon. Uh, look at the scripture, though. It's important for us to grasp, you know, understand. The scripture says in 2 Chronicles 7, and 12 and the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice but here's a con some conditions I need you to pay attention to if I shut up heaven and there be no rain look at somebody say if the drought comes or if I command the locust to devour the land. Look at somebody say, if destruction comes. Or if I send pestilence among my people. Look at somebody say, if disease comes. No matter whether it comes by the drought, by the catastrophe of destruction, by infectious disease, he says, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal the land. Somebody shout glory right there. 
Oh, I didn't hear y'all say it again. Shout glory right there. It's an interesting scripture, and in this scripture, I want us to pay attention to what Solomon had started that was attached to something that was generational, pointing to something that would lead to the church, eventually lead to us where we are right now. And because you're in such a unique posture with such a visionary who has a desire to not only just have church, but shift the neighborhood, the community, to you do unique things around that's never been done before for in this particular geographical area. I want to talk from these few words today. Look at somebody and say, finish the dream. That's what I want to talk about. Look at somebody else again. Tell them, finish the dream. While you're looking at it for him, I need you to look at it for yourself. Because you got some stuff that God started in you that's got to get finished. And I want you to prepare yourself to step into a place to see everything that God has ordained for your future. And accept it, the fact that you can finish the dream. Say it again one more time. Finish the dream. And so in the word of God, uh, this word gives us a demonstration of a covering that begins literally from Abraham. And it spans all the way, literally all the way to really Pentecost and then into literally uh, Paul's writings when he talks about the release of the gifts and the sacrifices we see in Ephesians 4. What is important for us to pay attention to here, if you just bear with me for a moment, there's something smack dab in the middle of this dialogue. The promise that shows up from Genesis 15 that becomes literally a manifestation in Acts 2. That we see the realization of it in Ephesians 4. All the way back in the second Chronicles 7 and 15, there is an awakening that takes place. And in second Chronicles, right in the middle of these particular events, he gives it as what is called in the Greek, an interesting word called a fulcrum. Somebody say fulcrum. It is a turning point in Latin in the instance that deals with the fact that God can use particular moments to shift the future. He puts us in a place where you got to remember how you end the chapter because that has everything to do with how you approach the next chapter. And so the fulcrum sits here and gives us a connection of uh, posture. It is a connection of uh, dreams and visions that weave their way throughout the generations. And uh, at the end of this, you get a chance to really see that when we talk about the church of God, the church at the end of this, that the church really is a representation of what God started a long time ago when he told them, to uh, tabernacle here with me and tabernacle here for your relationship with me. Your pastor is even a part of this visionary and dream picture because uh, understand your pastor has to be a vision protector. At the same time, he has to be a dream encourager. He has to understand at the same time that your visions, which is God letting you see your end and your, at your beginning and work toward it, and your dream is that suspended state that God drops you into so he can dialogue with you from when you are too cognitive in your awake hours where you can't pay attention to because so many things got your attention. He puts you to sleep so he can talk to you, and he speaks to you in your dreams and gives you something to grab hold on to so when you wake up, you got something that you can sit, that you be, got a burning for, and you don't even know where all that burning came from. When you talk about vision on one side and dream on the other side, he knows that the pastor's responsibility is also to realize that your visions are both natural and they are also spiritual. That your visions are natural come from outside in, but your vision spiritual goes from inside out. Understand he puts it in the posture that what you see from God is literally a privilege to have in God. And maybe your vision and your dream together is really God seeing into you what he's trying to get you to see for yourself. 
the scripture says in uh, sec, in Samuel 16 and 7 that God, that man looketh on the outward appearance but God looks at the heart and some of us would never pay attention if God had interrupted us from the inside to make us realize that we need to do something now on the outside understand in as his word gets in your heart it, it will literally begin to speak literally to your life but it needs protection it needs covering and so God sends these gifts and this is where the whole picture of sacrifice comes from where we see the text lined itself up because if we go back to Genesis and see the initial picture of this it is Abraham in the, the 15th chapter where he finally has a horror of a dream and God speaks to him after he told him to head to a particular place I'll show you where in Genesis 12. And then in, 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 in the 15th chapter, he finds himself in a position where he has a horror or the Bible says he has a bad dream. In the midst of this dream, he's going to God and saying, God, what shall I do about this situation? And as he has this dream, he feels himself getting locked up in the process of this particular dream. And God tells him, don't worry about this dream because all it means is that at some point, your people or your generation is going to go through tribulation. But don't worry about it because they will come out with great substance. Somebody here, look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, I don't care how bad it's ever gotten. God always has a way to bring me out of it. This is kind of what we see happen in the text because he is putting here and giving them an opportunity to see it. And so he tells Abraham, Abraham, I need you to make me some sacrifices. So I need you to go get in Genesis 15, get a red heifer and get a ram and get a she goat and get a pigeon and get a dove. And once you get them, I want you to get them and lay them out because I'm going to teach you how from this point on you're going to sacrifice to you understand what sacrificial offering is really all about. Now, if you look at Genesis 15, you have to stand on the side of Genesis 15 and point into the New Testament to understand and fully what the sacrifice is all about. Because the sacrifice does not really become a living sacrifice till you get to the New Testament. Because it is in the New Testament, the Bible says in, uh, in Acts 2, after the Holy Spirit comes, that now he begins to release gifts and release himself even to men. Now here's the blessing of this because he changes the order of what the sacrifice's obligation is. Romans 12 1 and 2 says, I beseech you therefore brethren that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. The old sacrifices had to be killed. They had to be dead. But the New Testament sacrifice had to be alive. Now look like it looks like he expanding from the history all the way even into the legitimacy of the church and what the church is going to represent. So when we look at it and see Paul pick it up in his dialogue in Ephesians 4, he takes those same sacrifices and he puts gifts and attaches them to it. He takes the heifer, the red heifer, and Paul takes it and says, this is the apostle. This is the one that I'm sending with orders to do the will and the work of the Lord. Then he takes the ram, the one with the horn, and says this is the prophet. This is the one that's going to point out to you the things that you need to do. And then he takes the she goat and says this is the pastor. This is the one that's going to nurture you and give you what you need to get to where you have to be next. Then he takes the pigeon there out of Genesis 15 and go to Ephesians and he is the evangelist. He's always going flying here. Or she's always flying here there telling what the word of God is. And then eventually the dove, which is the teacher that shows up in Ephesians 4. When you look at it, you now are beginning to see if you pay close attention that God is weaving through all of this a connection of dreams to manifest his literal purpose, kingdom purpose in the earth. And because he's setting it up that way, he's giving opportunity for us to see how he orders our steps and put us in unique postures to be a part of his order for our future. And while you're yet pressing, you've got to be 
in a posture where you stick with what God has said regardless of what you're going through and realize that God is the only one that can take you through every situation that you find yourself in and having to come out of. Here he is in a unique posture. He says, now, even though you're going to go through some stuff, you can't be ever so embarrassed by your mistakes that you put down your posture in place in ministry because you have to never let uh, embarrassment take over for the reason why you're not fulfilling the desideratum or the cause of what you have been ordained to do. If you understand it under this context, God never tells us to flee embarrassment because uh, embarrassment only remit, reveals our human frailty. Fear of embarrassment basically says that I don't fully respect my covering because if you respect your covering, you understand your covering's got your back. Whether things are working for you the way you want them to work for you or not. And until you've been embarrassed and colored, covered, you never even understand what real deliverance is all about. You gotta mess up and get up. Come on, talk to somebody. Say, you got to mess up and then get back up. No, you didn't talk to somebody. That was the wrong person. Look at somebody. Say, you gotta mess up and get right back up. You got to know that even if I blow it and I call on Jesus, he can get me out of this. He got my covering there to help me get through my situation and get me to where I have to be next. And so in this instance, here comes then this pastor, this local pastor, this apostle for you. And your pastor is stuck even in his preaching in saying what you said and clearing up what you think at the same time. Because if he don't say what you said and clear up what you think, you will never have confirmation. So he got to talk to you at your level and then talk you past where you are so you can see where you can go and understand who you can be. Because once you get confirmation, all it is is that God sending his interruption into your conversation without your permission to let you know this is what I meant whether you thought I meant it or not. Somebody here ought to thank God because he interrupted you. Because there was some stuff you thought you had it going on but God God knew how to bring exactly what you need so you can get to where you need to be next. This is it. Here's the challenge here. Because when we see something and God shows us something, whether it is a vision, the dreams, our challenges, our life challenges show up. What is that? Many of us are better at having a dream than we are at chasing a dream. All right. Somebody here talk to your neighbors and neighbor. <laughs> Are you all right at having a dream? But are you really all right at chasing the dream? Because a lot of us can say I had some dreams. But how many of you can look at your dreams and say I chased it until God made it happen? It's a big difference when you have to chase your dream. It puts you in a different posture. And what we see happening in the text here is a series of interwoven dreams that have been connected down throughout the times. And how you look at things have everything to do with how well you're going to adapt the future that's attached to it. Some look at things apathetically. Some look at it empathetically. Others look at things simply Apathetically, and others look at it prophetically. Uh, apathetic folk look without having a whole lot of care. Empathetic try to hear, but not always do they attach themselves fully. Sympathetic people attach themselves based upon the feeling attached to it, but not the reality of what they go through. But prophetically speaks to the essence of really what God is saying and what the future says about it. When we look at this, we understand that this is a picture of a dream. And I look at the Chronicles 7, it looks like a dream. And the Bible even says that the Lord appeared to Solomon by night. It's in an interesting posture here because some stuff had led into this. Solomon is carrying on a dream of building God a house, of developing in the midst of where he is. Uh, all the greatness that God has ordained for the people he put him with. And God is setting him up 
to have an opportunity to do something phenomenal. And he's now got to get the message to people who some of them get it, some of them don't get it. Some of them want to do it, some of them don't want to do nothing else. So he's caught now in the perplexed situation having to deal with people who have gone through the situations and matters and have not yet grasped the fact that God's got them sitting in the middle of a blessing. Won't you stop here for a minute and tell your neighbor whether you know it or not. You're sitting in the midst of a blessing. My God, you ought to give somebody a high five and say, I know I am. <laughs> when you're sitting in the midst of a blessing, you treat the word different. You treat life different. You treat situations different. When you know you're in the midst of a continuum of opportunity that God has ordered. The fact remains even today that this particular dream didn't start with Solomon, but David had, his daddy had it before him. And before his daddy had it, you can go all the way back to Moses. And before Moses had it, you can go all the way back to, to, to Abraham and see that this is a continuation of situations that God made promises and he was working to make it happen in the generation it was literally called for. When we see it in this particular light, we understand then what God is doing here because sometimes God just connects us in a posture to teach us that we're living through prophecy. Talk to somebody and say, we're living through prophecy. We're carrying hopes that didn't start with us. And the truth is, is that some of us, the only reason we got some benefit is because somebody prayed for us. Somebody looked and expected God to do some things in our lives. Somebody who saw their road coming to an end actually put us on the same road to make sure that we keep on going and finish the journey and complete the task. Some of us don't know how blessed we are, but the fact we are where we are is often based upon somebody who prayed. Sometimes it was grandma, sometimes it was grandfather, sometimes it was mother at the church. Uh, so you don't know who all had led into and spoken to the heavenlies regarding your particular life. And sometimes the only reason the devil can't get to you is because God has heard the prayer of somebody and that prayer just keeps interrupting him. Somebody here need to talk to your devil. Your neighbor said, neighbor, the devil would have had me if God wouldn't have interrupted him. Every once in a while, all God does is come in and he throws in a block. He throws in something that makes the enemy know that he cannot handle my situation or mess up my future. Puts me in a unique posture and lets me know that regardless where I am, that I'm going to make it. Somebody here, I'll encourage your neighbor and tell him, I don't care how you go through, you're going to make it through this. Yeah. And so when we look at this, we understand that our accomplishments are always including somebody else's dream. When we look at it this way, we understand how we got here. Because in this particular text, we see certain things begin to open up. The Bible says in the beginning of this chapter, in the, in, in the very first verse in Chronicles 7, it says, Now Solomon had made an end of praying. And when he made an end of praying, three things happened. The first thing that happened is that fire came down and it burnt the offerings. And then the glory of the Lord came out down and finally it filled the house somebody say it filled all the house and when it filled the house the priest could not stand to enter into the house because the glory of the Lord had filled the house and when all the children saw how the fire came down the glory of the Lord upon the house they bowed themselves with their faces to the Lord upon the house and they bowed themselves with their faces upon the ground upon the pavement then the Bible says and they worship and praise the Lord saying for the Lord is good for his mercy endureth forever. My God they finally got it. It looks like God was setting them up. Well what preceded this? What made all of this stuff happen? Well to understand the history behind it we have to go back to the fifth chapter because at the fifth chapter when we get there we finally see that the temple is finally bent, built. They've been, uh, they've been tabernacling ever since it Moses day and finally after coming from Moses day all the way through David's day now into Solomon's day the temple 
is finally completed. And now everything is about to take place. Somebody say it's about to go down now. It looks like everything that's messed up is getting ready to be fixed up. It looks like everything that they lost, they're about to get it back. It looks like the blessing that they've been waiting for is now about to come, become part of their reality. It looks like where they had loose ends that's getting tightened up. It looks like what the devil meant for evil, they're getting ready to see how God meant it for their good. And things are shifting in the atmosphere. Is there anybody in here who sense where you are in life right now? And you realize that you're at a unique, specific place that is only ordained by God. And if the devil could have stopped you, he would have stopped you. But the fact is that God has set you up to be blessed. And because God has set you up to be blessed, you made up your mind. I can't stop right here because I got too far into this. Somebody talk to your neighbor and say, I'm too far into this to quit now. Now, when they find themselves in this particular position, some unique things begin to happen. In the fifth chapter, the Bible says they got happy and excited when they were it was time to go in and celebrate because it was time to say God did it. Anybody in here got a God did it praise? Anybody here got some stuff that you know you right on the brink of? Have you getting ready? You got your you already got all your spiritual confetti ready. You got you ready to lift him up and magnify his name because you know it hasn't been by accident that you got through all you went through. You know that your generations has been calling for this and you know that something wonderful is going to happen in your future. Somebody get ready to holler and say, God did it. God. When you know that God did it, you start putting yourself in a different posture and you stop worrying about what anybody thinks because you realize that any moment, any something great and foundational and fundamental can shift our atmosphere and bring up and to pass what God has ordered for our life. Somebody look at your name and say, look out, God's about to do it for you. Now, when we look at what happened in, 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 in the fifth chapter, the, they broke out, the Bible says, and I like to talk about this, into a crazy radical praise. Ask your neighbor, say, neighbor, when is the last time that you praised him like you lost your mind? No, 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 don't. They didn't answer you. Find somebody you can ask for real. Say, when is the last time you praised him like you lost your mind? When is the last time you had a praise that couldn't wait a minute? You, I mean, you wanted to hold that you couldn't hold it. The old folks say I said I wasn't going to tell nobody but I couldn't keep it to myself. When is the last time that God interrupted your calmness, your coolness, your sedate disposition and he showed you how good he is and you got the I can't help us because God started proving that he's God in your every situation. When is the last time that he woke you up in the middle of a night when you were just thinking about his goodness and you almost wanted to jump out the bed and say thank you Jesus for what you're doing in my life. Here they are in an I can't help it praise. Talk to your name and say a radical praise. Now what I like about this is that when we look at how this came into being, then the, the scripture says that when they had got into the, te the, te the temple, the first thing they were told to do is to take all the artifacts that Moses had and then take all the new stuff that you have, all the stuff from the old and the new and bring them together at one time. I want you to sanctify the old and the new because I want everybody to know from this point that the tabernacle is no more but the tabernacle now is into the temple and that the temple is now the mainstay. You have not lost anything. You're just gaining. And so here it is. God picks the people that he wants to be in this. It's interesting here because it's almost similar to the 120 at Pentecost. He gets people who are movers. He gets people who are shakers. And he gets people who are shifters. Let me say it to you again. He gets people who are movers. And he gets people who are shakers. And he gets people who are shifters. Everybody can't be in this group. He's got to have some movers because the movers are the folk who can't stand for stuff to stay the same. So he gets those folk in the group. Then he gets the shakers. And the shakers are the ones who are ready to start something. They come in the door, can't wait to get ready to see God do 
something he hasn't done before. But then he also adds the shifters. Somebody says shifters. These are the ones here are ready to move whenever and however God says move. Here they are. They in there together. And here's the key. You see, the, those who led in ministry led in the praises. So those who were leading in ministry were the first ones to get their praise on. They didn't wait for nobody else to get it. Those who had the fire were the ones who caught on fire. Those who had it were the first ones to step forth and say, it's our turn. Now, it was right there that the scripture says and the Bible says that the Levites could not wait to praise him, to take advantage of that very moment because they understood that any time they got together that God could cause things to shift. Won't you look down your row and grab your neighbor by the hand and say, neighbor, if we just praise him for a few minutes here, God will shift some stuff right here in our presence. My God, he'll make some stuff happen right where we are. When you know what you're working with, you realize that you that they can't play your cheap spiritually. Because see, they may talk about what you got in your pocket, but they can't talk what's in your spirit. If you know you're powerful on the inside, something on the inside will rise up in you, even in the midst of your storm, and let you know you can make it, and something wonderful is going to happen. They did not wait for the spirit to hit them. They knew they were already touched by God. And the scripture says there in the 13th verse of Chronicles 5 says basically it says that the glory of the Lord fell and the ministers could not even stand to minister because the glory of the Lord had filled the place. Somebody holler crazy praise. Matter of fact look down your road say crazy in here. Every once in a while you ought to go crazy and how you lift up God. If you got a dream you know God's about to answer. You got a door you know God is about to open. If you got some situations that you know God can fix. Talk to your name and say it's about time for us to get ready to go crazy in here. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Sit down y'all. I'm going to be done in a few minutes. Now when we look here we understand some of the stuff that's really happening here. Because see crazy praise is a radical praise done by groups of committed people who fill the sanctuary knowing at any moment an expression of God can take over the whole atmosphere. And that our separate stories can unite together. I can say what he's done for me and you can say what he's done for you and by the time we get through we all end up giving him praise like we never have before. Understand these are people who got it now and they figured it out and the scripture says that by the time they get to the 6th chapter Solomon leaves and he goes into a time of praying and as he goes into a time of praying here he finds himself talking to God about the situation and he looks at it. He's grateful that God used him to do it. Second, 1 Kings 9 2 through 9 talks about it as well and it talks about the sequence of God how God ordered the blessing on their lives you see because every dream is going to need management for longevity that if God gives the dream understand you just don't order your dream you also got to manage your dream took your name said you got to manage your dream if God gave it to you you can't fake it and later on and act like it's yours by yourself but you got to ask God what to do with it. At the end of it then, don't just release your life in a perspective of the future but actually practice your way into the place you believe. Knowing that if you hope God will call something foundational to happen in your life and bless your life and he'll make you want what like you've never wanted before. Come on talk to somebody and say he'll make you want huh? like you never wanted before. This is the essence of what they see happening here. They found themselves excited about the fact that God was setting them up to actually have what they never had before. But here was the challenging part. Now that they knew that they were going to have it, now that they understood, uh, here God comes and he speaks at the beginning of the seventh chapter letting uh, uh, Solomon know that your prayers have been answered. Can somebody help me here and point to the apostle and tell him God has answered your prayers. <laughs> The truth is that God has answered your prayers. That even that which you don't
don't see that you even have dreamed. Even that that's part of vision. Even that that's part of the manifestation that is to come. God has already synchronized and put in order and structured the how it's going to happen. As a matter of fact, even sometime when the enemy comes in to try to say it's not going to happen, God then shows up and proves that, listen here, no matter what the enemy says, he said, I'm going to make sure whatever I promise you is going to become part of your reality. Just hang on in there. Somebody ought to help me here and talk to your neighbor and say, listen, hang on in here. you got to trust God through the process. you got to trust God through the ups. You have to trust God through the downs. you got to trust God when you like it. you got to trust God when you're disliking it. But you got to know that God can turn it around for you. At any moment, somebody help me. Just say, God can turn it around. And so in essence, what we literally see happening in the text is a great opportunity for him to see what God has manifest, that he might be able to finish the dream, dream, but he sets it up after he gets through praying. The Bible says that after he prays here, that fire comes down, that the sacrifice he has is burnt up, and that the glory of the Lord fills the house. And after that, we begin to see here that God shows up in the 12th verse. And it says, and the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and says to him, I've heard your prayer and I've chosen this place to myself as a place for a house of sacrifice. And I want you to know that I don't care if the drought come, you're going to be all right. Somebody talk to your neighbor and say, if the drought come, you still going to be all right. Somebody ought to tell uh, Apostle Mark, say, I don't care if the drought come, you, you you still gonna be all right. The fact is, he starts off by saying, "If there be no rain, because the drought can only come." He says, "If I shut up heaven," he said, "And if he shuts up heaven, he's got the power to open it up again." The fact is that he can shut it up for somebody else. At the same time, as yes, he can open it up for you, understand? He said, "Let the drought come, and you gonna still be all right." And then he turns around and says, See, "Don't even worry if locusts come and devour." the land. If there's the certain situation that looks like everything around you is crumbling, but you still standing, start shouting in place and start glorifying the Lord. And listen here, all that has not that gets tore up means all that needs to be rebuilt. And so what God does is give you a chance to have your new thing without having to go through demolition. God has set you up to be blessed and let you know that he'll move things out your way. The fact is that he'll let somebody else occupy what belongs to you and let them do work on it. Let them fix it up. Let them go through the process. Let them go through all the stuff and then say to them, you can't handle this. Then he'll turn around and put it in your hand and he'll call it yours. Somebody talk to your neighbor and say, neighbor, look out, look out. If God can do it for him, he can do it also for us. Somebody here help me preach and tell your neighbor, no, God can do it just like he did it. Just like he did it for him. He can do it for us. And God sets us up to be blessed. You don't have to worry about anybody stopping it. Or worry about anybody blocking it. But if you trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not into your own understanding. But in all of your ways acknowledge him. God can come on and he will hallelujah direct your path. Talk to your neighbor and say, let him do it, let him do it. He sets this thing up and says, listen here, the dry places may come, destruction may come, even, even if I send infectious disease and you get in a position because you know that's how I did Israel every time they disobeyed. I made sure even the locusts came. I made sure that the water dried up, that the water dried up, or I made sure at the end that disease came to get them. He said, no matter what it is, I just as I can shut you down, I can also revive you and give you a brand new chance. Somebody talk to your name and say, they won't give you another chance. So when we begin to look at the text, the text begin to say, listen here, you got to recognize that no matter how bad it gets, I got your back. Somebody here ought to talk to your name and tell your neighbor, no matter what it looks like, God has got your back. If God's got your back, stop worrying about the outcome. If 
you trust him through the process, God will make everything turn around for you. The Bible here says, in my people who are called by my name, will just humble themselves and pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sins, and I will heal the land. Talk to your neighbors and neighbor. Look out because restoration is a part of the ingredient of what your future ha- is going to have. God has set you up that the windows that have been shut, they're about to open now. That the doors that have been blocked, they're about to be removed now. That the schemes that have been set up, they're about to fall now. And whatever God says is yours. You can start shouting in advance saying that the blessing is mine. Somebody help me talk to your neighbor and say, it's your time to be blessed. When you know it's your time, you begin to treat things a little different and you realize I'm not here by mistake, but I'm here on purpose. And when you know that you're there on purpose, you start looking for God to do something. Start talking to your neighbor and say, neighbor, God is begging ready to do something you never imagined before. I like the scripture that said that I have not seen and ear have not heard and neither has it been revealed to the hearts of men the things that God has in store for them that love him. Talk to your neighbor and say at any moment he can give you everything that you need. When we begin to look at God and expect God, we begin to begin to sense and have an expectation that God can do anything. Now expectation is one thing, but God will graduate your expectation and turn it into anticipation. And anticipation is expectation with steroids. And anticipation makes you be able to taste it. And anticipation makes you be able to feel it. Anticipation makes you be able to know it. You know that any moment God can make it happen for you. Somebody ought to help me preach here and tell your neighbor I'm too close to stop where I am right now. I'm too close to end this thing where I am. I'm too close to let the devil get glory. The fact is that one thing I realize it's coming. It's coming. Get somebody a high five and say it's coming. When you know that it's coming, you stop holding your head down. When you know that it's coming, you change the way you stand. Oh, when you know it's coming, you know that you can get excited because you know that your trouble is gone on its way to an end. Somebody holler, it's coming. Let me close here in the next three minutes by telling you how is a word in the English that speaks to how God ends stuff. Every once in a while, God sends stuff. In the book of Job, it talks about the snow-capped mountains and how the snow would blow down. Well, in our English vernacular, we have a word that we use to describe it. It's called an avalanche. Somebody holler avalanche. I believe an avalanche is headed your way. Blessings that you never expected are coming your way. Now hold on a minute here. Let me help you understand what I mean when I holler avalanche. Somebody in here holler avalanche. I ended up having to do my research. And as I did my research, the first thing they said about an avalanche is that when an avalanche comes, it's a sudden overwhelming something. And when the avalanche comes, you can't stop it. Talk to your name and say, it can't be stopped. When God gets ready to bless you, don't worry about who wants to stop it. It cannot be stopped. The next thing about an avalanche, it travels in the wind and it whistles through the air. Sound like the Holy Ghost. It comes in like a rush and it taking flood and it lands as a landslide when the avalanche comes it inundates it literally overgrows 
cover covers. It engulfs and it overwhelms everything right where it is. Somebody holler avalanche. It lands with a quiet force and it blends in the atmosphere and it returns back to original silence. But when you come up out of it, you realize that God has done something. Now let me tell you, you gotta have special gifts to handle avalanches. You gotta have a faith that allows you while you're in the middle of the avalanche to keep your balance when you don't see which way you're going because the avalanche covers you up and won't let you see your direction even though you're going through it you gotta keep on pressing you gotta keep on going you gotta keep on trusting you gotta keep on depending you gotta keep on lending leading. you gotta keep on praying you gotta keep on fasting in the middle of it somebody holler avalanche coming my way God didn't say nothing look at somebody say avalanche coming my way here is the thing about an avalanche you never get a chance to experience the avalanche unless you're going upward unless you're going downward nobody who ain't going nowhere chance to have the avalanche as long as you're doing something blessing is coming your way find somebody on your road and tell them it's time to praise them because God's about to bless us like we've never been blessed before somebody holler yeah
is not how you start. Somebody holler, it's how you finish. <laughs> Somebody know he's going to do it. Find one name and say, before you get home, it's going to already be done. Somebody holler avalanche. My God. The blessing coming in my life, coming to my life can't be stopped. My God, I'm gonna stay on this path of faith. Change my direction. <laughs> I'm gonna make sure that I walk by faith and not by sight. Somebody say yeah. Hallelujah. Somebody shout glory in here if you don't mind. My God. Hallelujah. I need some this before this week out, folk, just to get out in the aisle and just walk around real quick. Before this week out, I know what's going to happen for me. today. Amen. I want you to lift your hand and say, God, I know you can finish my dream. God, I dare to dream it. And I dare to finish it. I know what you said you're going to do. I believe by faith that it's already done. In Jesus' name. Come on. Give God some glory in here. My God. While you're standing, we don't have to take long kind of to do this. Today, I want us, while you're right where you are, I want some to join, if you would, in this room. I'm going to start, bishops, uh, the offering on this particular night for this man of God, $550 from me. And this, uh, I want those who can get $50. That's all I want you to do, $50 to stand with me. Stand and come quickly, come quickly. If you would come. Uh, just get it and get it to stand and I'll know that that's who you are. You're coming. You can do your electronic giving up here. Something you don't have. You may say you don't have that cash, but you can use your card right up here. And prepare yourself to give. Amen. We want to be a blessing. I need to see some who's going to stand at least with the $50 offer on today and join us. See, I see some of you shaking your head. You're going to do it. Stand with us quickly. Let me see you. I need to see you. Thank you. Yeah, I need to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Come quickly. 
Amen. Not yet, if you will. Just hold it a moment. I want to pray with those who are coming. Some more need to come. May God has blessed you. $50 is not going to break you for what you need God to do. Amen. Today, in this particular instance, you got a dream that needs to be answered today. Come on. Today, those who can and $50 on tonight be a blessing today on this week tonight. Amen. Thank you. Some more coming there. Yes, the world didn't give it. Here comes another. Thank you in the world. You can be in Tuesday. Listen, you get $20 off this night stand. I know you can. This joy I have. Oh. $20 offer. Come on, come on from wherever you are. Come on, I know you can do that tonight. Come from wherever you are. The man of God didn't ask for a big offering first service. First time, first offering. Hallelujah. This peace I have. This peace I have. This peace I have. Come on, thank you. This you peace I have. $20 offering today. Come on. The world didn't give it. The world didn't give it I see those you coming. Come some more and come join us. God bless you. This is Randy G. And I am so excited. We are getting ready to celebrate Apostle Mark Anthony Hinton in his ministry as well as his birthday. Hi, I'm Shalita Crater, and I'm here to invite you to join us for our celebration of ministry here in Monument of Faith Church. Starting May the 27th through June the 1st, we have some profound speakers that's going to preach the word on that week. Starting with Sunday, May 27th, is going to be Bishop Anthony Pagee. He'll be right here at 2.30 p.m. Tuesday, May 29th at 7 p.m., our very own pastor, Apostle Mark Anthony Hinton, will be speaking. Wednesday, May 30th, will be Bishop Marvin Sapp. You don't want to miss this. Thursday, May 31st, is going to be none other than Bishop Simon Gordon. Friday, June 1st at 7 p.m. is going to be Bishop Kenneth Franklin. All the service will be held here at Monument of Faith Church, 2750 West Columbus Avenue. We want to see you here. God bless you, and I am so excited about you being with us today as you watch us live stream here at the Monument of Faith Evangelistic Church. Today, you are a part of our Monument family. That's right, you're in the service just like we are wherever you're enjoying this program. Maybe you're at home, sitting on your couch or in the bed, or maybe you're somewhere else. I believe that this service has blessed and will continue to bless you as we move forward with the service. Listen. It's time now for us to give. Hallelujah. The word of God declares that if you give, it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. I believe that out of my own experience, I've learned the power of sowing into the kingdom of God. And I want you right now to stop, take the time, and I want you to sow. You can go to Givelify, Givelify, to M-O-F-E-C, church. That's the Monument of Faith Evangelistic Church. Go to Givelify, and I want you to sow. I want you to be a blessing, and watch how God multiplies you because of your obedience. Let me be honest with you. Giving is not about the dollar amount. It is about the act of obedience, that when you can trust God with what you have, he can release what he has into your life. 
because God does not move outside of obedience. Hallelujah. The word declares that he loves a cheerful giver and we're encouraged to sow into God's kingdom. You want to be multiplied? Be a part of giving and watch God do what you need done in your life. You know what I want to do? I want to pray right now that God will multiply you and bless you for your act of faith and for your obedience. The Bible declares that the liberal soul shall be made fat, and I believe that. God, I thank you right now for those that are watching under the sound of my voice that are watching this program, those, God, that are watching us live stream to whom you've touched their heart even now to sow into your kingdom. I thank you for multiplying them and blessing them, God, in the abundance of only that that you can do. And we thank you for it now in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen, amen, and amen. I believe it. Listen to me. I want you to know that God's going to do that very thing that you're believing him for. We're getting ready to go back into the service. I want you to enjoy the word of God. Because I just think Mark ought to be somewhere. Yeah, come on, man. I think he wants his name to be Jamark. You don't say hi? Not quite, huh? So we thank God for his goodness. We've been so blessed by the word of the Lord this evening. We've been tremendously, tremendously blessed. And uh, I thank God for his goodness. Come on, stand on your feet. We're getting ready to be dismissed. All right, stand on your feet. I'm trying to, I'm trying to work on him now so he can be preaching by the time he gets might take him a little while and say hello praise the lord amen anything <laughs> might take a little work <laughs> we're gonna keep working on him i'm so glad to see pastor mallet here with me tonight amen and pastor Irvin tate amen glad to have you tonight pastor priscilla wilder is in the room and for everyone that have come bless you I'm so glad to see some people from Center of Life. I'm always glad to see Sister Phillips and to see Sister Rosemary Prather. Good to see you all tonight. Amen. As we're thanking God for his goodness, take somebody by the hand, if you will. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Tomorrow night, tomorrow night, none other than Bishop Franklin is going to be here. Bishop Kenneth Franklin. We're going to have a wonderful time in the Lord. I want to see you back here tomorrow night and uh, come expecting God to do great things even as he has blessed us on tonight. God has smiled on me. He has set me free. been good. Dear Father and God, we thank you for your loving kindness, even as we join hands with our sister and our brother. We're thankful for the opportunity to worship and to fellowship, God. We pray, God, that you will bless the messenger, even as the messenger have blessed your people, that you will pour into him and multiply him, cause him to be increased for your glory. We pray, God, that as we prepare ourselves to leave this place, that you will cover us with your blood. Keep us safely as we travel the highways and the streets. We come against thieves and robbers, purse snatchers and carjackers and drunk driving and text and driving. And we thank you for safe passage, God. That when they get into their households, God, when they get into their homes, that they will go in there, God, and find everything well. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And we thank you right now, God, for keeping us thank you for your word that is a lamp unto our feet and we pray oh god in the mighty name of jesus keep us safe that we'll come again and give you praise in jesus name amen and amen